Our next study on jumping performance and jumping biomechanics is a, a very recent study, a 2020 study, so published earlier this year by Kip et al., uh, titled Joint and Subject Specific Strategies in Male Basketball Players Across a Range of Counter-Movement Jump Heights. Um, if you look at article history here, you can actually see that uh, this article was accepted for publication over a year ago, so June uh, 2019, so last summer and you know, even a month ago from, uh, from a year ago last summer. Um, academic publishing and scientific publishing can be really, really slow. And you're often, when you're, when you're reading a, a new paper, often that's kind of last year's news to the authors of that paper. It's not, uh, you, often it's not their latest and greatest, most cutting edge work, just because it takes quite a while uh, to, to publicly communicate these results through, through publications and scientific journals for, uh, for a variety of reasons. So better or, for better or worse, that's, that's the system we're stuck with at the moment in uh, scientific publishing. Um, so this was a study where they, uh, uh, no more computer simulations, at least in this study. This was one with experiments on human subjects. Um, they had a group of uh, fairly accomplished skilled jumpers. So 11 uh, male NC2A Division I basketball players, which are gen generally people that are pretty good at jumping, um, performed uh, counter movement jumps at a variety of what they call here effort levels at 25%, uh, 50%, 75 and 100%. Um, basically what this means is they jumped to uh, four different heights, as high as they could, and then 75% as high as they could, half as high as they could, and a quarter high as they could. Okay? Um, they were then observing or then uh, quantifying through, through biomechanical uh, uh, measurements and modeling of the data, um, the strategies of the uh, work, the mechanical work done by the muscles at the three main lower limb joints, at the hip and at the knee and at the ankle, um, in terms of how the work at those joints scaled up with the uh, effort level of the jump and the height achievement of the jump. So not a whole lot here that would speak directly to like increasing jump height, like increasing how high you actually get with your 100% uh, jump effort, but something that could sort of speak to that, right? Like if you see uh, certain changes in, the, in, in what's happening mechanically at the joints, kind of increasing and leveling off as, as we reach 100% here, maybe that thing that you see leveling off, maybe whether it's at the hip or at the knee or at the ankle or some combination of these things, um, maybe that's where you're being limited in your jump height, and that's where you need to focus your uh, your mechanics and, and and your training or your practice on to to further increase your jump height. So I'm, I'm speculating a bit there. We can't really uh, definitively uh, conclude such things from from these uh, these data, which weren't a training study. They were not trying to jump to 110 percent. They were just uh, jumping at 100 percent and then levels below 100 percent. But 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 something that we could practically use here, uh, possibly for training for increasing that 100 uh, percent effort level in terms of the performance. Okay, so pretty straightforward uh, setup of the study. They took uh, measurements of uh, forces and motion um, on the body and computed from that the uh, mechanical work done by the, uh, the major muscles of the hip and the knee and the ankle um, when these uh, 11 uh, highly skilled, highly well-trained uh, jumpers uh, jumped to these uh, four different effort levels. So uh, looking at the uh, mechanics of the joints that were involved in increasing, uh, jump, in, in increasing jump height in terms of uh, more effortful jumps. And what did they see? Um, key finding is down here in figure two. Okay, And let me walk you through here because this is a, a lot of information on this figure. Um, on the x-axis in each of these six panels is the jump height that they reached. Okay, So the one on the far right here would be uh, for each of these lines would be the highest jump and then the the lower levels here would be the the, the, the lower jumps So here they have it expressed as height rather than has a, a percentage But as you move to the right here the, the jumpers were jumping to to higher levels of their of, of their the higher fractions of their hundred percent uh, Max effort jump up, up to their up to their max effort hundred percent jump on, on the far right They just have it expressed here in terms of the the meters of the height not in terms of the, the percentage of the effort um, the top row is what's called the concentric work at the joint, whether it's the hip or the knee or the ankle. And the bottom work, or the bottom uh, row, is the eccentric work at the joint. Okay? Um, and then the uh, first column here is the data for the hip. The second column is the data for the knee. And the third column is the data for the ankle. Um, the lighter colored lines are individual subject results and the dark lines are uh, average results averaged across all of the subjects. And so if we just look at the dark lines, if we just look at the thick lines here, you can see that as we move from the left to the right, um, so as we increase uh, jumping effort from you know, a submaximal effort on the left up until a maximal effort on the right, 
that we, on average at least, increase the concentric work at all three of the joints, at the hip and the knee and the ankle. And we also, this this will maybe sound a little confusing because the line's sloping downward, um, but we also increase the eccentric work at each one of those joints, at the hip and at the knee and at the uh, ankle. Um, why is eccentric work increasing? Why did I say this is increasing because it's sloping downward? Up here I just said concentric work is increasing because it's, it's going upward. It looks like it's decreasing down here for eccentric work. Um, eccentric work typically has a negative sign attached to it. This is a an, 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 an estimation of how much energy is being absorbed, how much mechanical energy is being absorbed by the joint. So it has a negative uh, value here. So um, absorbing more eccentric work here would be a, a greater negative value for eccentric work. And so that's why the line is sloping downward, even though I'm saying it's, it's increasing here. It's a, it's, it's a larger negative value, meaning you're uh, uh, absorbing more uh, negative work at the joint. Um, in contrast that the, the concentric work is the work performed by the joint or the work uh, generated by the joint. Um, and so this is why that uh, line is increasing upwards and having a more positive value. Okay, so another way of thinking of this would be that you're doing more positive concentric work to jump higher regardless of the joint at the hip and the knee and the ankle. And you're also doing more negative eccentric work at the joint. Uh, at, at all three of those uh, joints. Um, not so much, it's not quite as obvious here at the ankle. Um, it was on average kind of sloping downward a little bit, the eccentric work, but not not quite as dramatic, not quite as sensitive um, as, uh, as the other two joints here, as, as the hip uh, on the left and the knee in the middle. Okay, let's take a look here at a video, and hopefully I can demonstrate to you what this eccentric concentric work business is beyond just talking about it. So the, regardless of the joint here, the eccentric work that's done at the joint is whether it's the hip or the knee or the ankle, um, that's typically going to be the work that the joint does, the work that the muscles spanning those joints do um, during the kind of downward part of the counter movement jump while you're on the ground. So during this part of the jump where I'm dipping down like that. Okay? And then the concentric work that those joints do is going to be largely done when I'm pressing upward against gravity up into the air and leaving the ground. Um, in reality, the mechanics are a little bit more complicated than that. You're not necessarily only doing um, eccentric work while the center of mass is moving down, and you're not necessarily only doing uh, concentric work when the center of mass is moving up. But just broadly speaking in general, most of your eccentric work is going to be do, uh, done when you're um, ducking down or dipping down in that early part of the movement and most of your concentric work is going to be done um, when you are pushing upwards against the ground later on in the movement. Um, another way of thinking of this is that I'm doing eccentric work when I'm uh, letting gravity help me, as I'm letting gravity kind of pull me into the ground like this, and then as I start resisting that motion, as I start then uh, arresting my motion and pressing upward against the ground, then I start transitioning to uh, producing concentric work as I'm pressing upwards against gravity rather than letting gravity assist me and pull me down into the ground. Okay. Um, in general, a, a muscle is doing um, concentric work when it's producing force while it's shortening. So for example, if I just start in the bottom of my squat here, as I press upwards into the air, I'm extending my hips, which shortens my glutes, I'm extending my knees, which shortens my quadriceps, and I'm plantar flexing my ankles, which shortens my plantar flexors. Okay. So as I'm pressing upwards there against gravity, um, all three of those muscle groups are producing force. The, the glutes are producing force, the quadriceps are producing force, the plantar flexors are producing force, and all three of them are shortening at that time. So when you're producing force um, with a muscle when it's getting shorter, that's concentric work by that muscle and will be manifest at the joint level most of the time as uh, concentric work at the joint. Um, if you are lengthening the muscle, if you're stretching the muscle while it's producing force, like I'm doing here when I start straight up and down and then dip down like this, here I'm flexing the hip, which stretches my glutes, I'm flexing the knee, which stretches the quadriceps, and I'm dorsiflexing the ankle, which stretches my plantar flexors, 
there I'm producing force with those muscles while they're being lengthened, which is gonna be uh, negative work by those muscles. Mathematically, we would typically uh, define that as negative work um, or eccentric work by those muscles, which will again typically be manifest as uh, eccentric work or negative work at those joints. Um, so you can kind of think of each, uh, each muscle and each joint involved here in, in this counter movement jump motion as being kind of like a spring, right? I load up the spring, I compress the spring by dipping down in my counter movement, and then I release the spring, pushing upwards against gravity to complete my counter movement to push off the ground. So load up the spring with my eccentric work, and then release the spring or spring back off the ground with my concentric work. Now these joints and muscles, of course, aren't like literal passive springs, and you usually see these uh, sorts of models like this referring to the like the stiffness of the joint as, you know, like a quasi stiffness where it's not really, you know, literally a spring that has, you know, a passive stiffness to it like a rubber band does, but it sort of behaves mechanically um, just in terms of its overall mechanical behavior as uh, sort of like a spring where you load it up with some uh, negative work and then we uh, uh, un unload the spring and release the spring to get that back as, as concentric work on the center of mass. So even though the muscle and the, the joint is, of course, not literally a spring, it sort of behaves conceptually similar to a spring. Compress it, load it up, and release it, and ideally get that energy back as work performed on the center of mass to lift it up um, against gravity. So from that perspective, it kind of makes sense that to jump higher, I would uh, load up my joints overall with more negative work and then release them by, uh, per, by converting that negative work to positive work as I, as I press against the ground and move the center of mass up in the air. So kind of here on average, they saw a general strategy where to jump higher, individuals performed uh, more eccentric work with all three other joints, maybe not so much with, with the ankle, but on average, you know, the line's sloping down there so we could at least uh, qualitatively say more eccentric work at the ankle as well and then uh, uh, ended up also performing more positive concentric work with those same joints as we jumped uh, higher, jumped to higher fractions of our maximum height. Okay, so on average, that was the story here. Um, the more, I'd say more interesting thing that they highlight here is that, yeah, those black lines, that's the average story. But if you look at these gray lines, which are individual subjects, there's quite a bit of variance there, right? Um, in some cases, you see some, some sort of uh, at least overall similarity, like here for the change in eccentric joint work at the hip as people jumped to greater heights. Um, all of those lines look to me like they're pointing downward, right? Except for this guy right here, right? That one is sloped upward. And even if we ignore that one, some of them are kind of sloped downward a little bit, but then we see this one here that's sloped downward a heck of a lot, way more than everybody else. And then if we look at some of these other results here, we see even more kind of variability here between subjects. For my, my ankle here, for example, the concentric work done at my uh, ankle joint, yeah, on average, it was an increase in uh, concentric ankle joint work as jump height increased, but some of the subjects slope upward, some of them slope upward a lot, some of them are pretty flat, some of them slope downward a little bit, some of them slope downward a lot, right? So it seems like maybe these overall average results are not reflective of, uh, of individual level results. And that's kind of what they get into in the, the rest of the paper here. That's what's highlighted uh, with some examples here in, in uh, figure three, just showing how much variability here there was uh, from subject to subject in terms of the uh, strategies of coordinating their joint work to, to jump to greater heights. Now, let me pull up my video here again. And we kind of went over this already, but I just wanted to highlight again um, why particularly concentric work at the joints is a good thing for jump height. Um, remember, jump height energetically is all about having the greatest potential energy and the greatest kinetic energy in the vertical direction at takeoff as you can. And doing concentric work with uh, any one of my three joints in terms of the, the extensors of those joints contributes to those things. Like if I start here, squatted down like this, and if I then do uh, concentric work with my ankle plantar flexors, then that lifts me up into the air, right? Um, it lifts up my center of mass, and while I'm in the act of lifting it, it's also increasing the uh, kinetic energy of the center of mass. So it lifts me higher up into the air, and it also is increasing the velocity while I'm in the act of performing that work, is increasing the velocity 
and the kinetic energy of the center of mass as well. Okay. Um, that's easiest for me to demonstrate with the ankle there. It's a little bit harder with the other joints to move them in isolation. But if I uh, extend my knees here, if I do concentric work with my knee extensors, concentric work with my knee joint there, then that also overall lifts me up into the air and increases my potential energy by lifting me up. And while I'm in the act of performing that work is increasing my velocity in the vertical direction. And same thing for doing uh, concentric work with my glutes here on my hip joint. As I um, contract those muscles and shorten them while they're producing force, that lifts my trunk up like that. And so moves the trunk up in the air. And also while I'm performing that work, the trunk is moving upward with a, with a positive upward velocity, increasing the overall kinetic energy in the vertical direction. So essentially any increase there in the uh, concentric work at the joints is potentially beneficial for uh, increasing jump height. Um, the tie in here to the eccentric work at the joints is if you buy into uh, conceptually treating the joints and the muscles like springs where the more energy that you store in the spring in terms of strain energy, the more you can potentially get back as kinetic energy or as, as uh, energy of motion and work done to lift the center of mass up in the air. Um, but what they saw here was that there was no uh, consistent strategy in terms of how they changed or how they increased the work at the joints um, in terms of the hip or the knee or the ankle or some combination of those joints in order to uh, get to their maximum jump height. So some people um, increased the concentric work and the eccentric work at all three joints to jump higher. So a strategy consistent with like the black lines here, the average strategy. Uh, but some people only did that for some of the joints. Some only increased their concentric work and only for some of the joints. And some didn't really seem to increase much of anything. They were doing something else, some, some unknown thing that maybe wasn't even measured to increase their jump height. So kind of long story short here is that increasing jump height on average here, if I just look at the black lines, seems to, to make sense. You want to do more eccentric work to, to load up the hypothetical spring and then more uh, concentric work to uh, get higher up in turn before you leave the ground and to leave the ground with a faster uh, velocity. But on if you look at the individual level, then not everybody does that. And not everybody seems to, to take that approach. And uh, individuals seem to be able to be successful in jumping high um, whether or not they, they take that kind of average approach and increase both types of work with all three joints as they try to jump higher. So does this mean some of them were like uh, holding themselves back or some of them had like bad technique and weren't jumping as high as they possibly could if they used a different strategy? That's where things get interesting, right? And that's where, that's where sports science gets hard and, and uh, kind of applied sports biomechanics and sports biomechanics in practice. Uh, gets hard. It's often really difficult to uh, figure out for an individual what exactly they should do to increase their individual specific performance. And we can look on average at what people do to be successful, but that often won't generalize to, to an individual who may be successful doing something else. And would they be even more successful if they did it mechanically a different way? Well, that, that's kind of hard to say sometimes. Um, I'm hoping I can get a, when we when we move on to the sprinting uh, topic in class here shortly, I'm hoping to uh, to get a guest speaker that could could speak to us on that on uh, on sprinting biomechanics and the importance of sprinting uh, performance in terms of individual level versus what generalizes to, to lots of individuals. Okay, that is it for today.